Hey guys, this is Nick and welcome to my Linux experiment. And today we're going to talk about this big boy. If you haven't seen my first impressions on this laptop, you can check out the card up top. But if you don't care, it's just the Neptune 15 from Juno Computers. I've been using this laptop as my daily driver for three weeks now. And uh, let's see how it performs, how it feels, how it works and how it was to just basically only use that thing for three weeks. Okay, so the Neptune 15 is sold by Juno Computers. It only sells laptops and desktops running Linux out of the box. In that sense, it's comparable to Tuxedo or System76's laptop. Uh, they just take Clevo designs or Tongfeng designs, rebrand them, remanufacture them, pick the parts they want and sell them as their own. Now, specs-wise, this machine is pretty powerful. My review unit came with an Intel Core i7 10875H with 8 cores and 16 threads. 16GB of DDR4 RAM, a 256GB M.2 NVMe SSD, and an NVIDIA RTX 2060. You could even configure it with 64GB of RAM, 4TB of SSD, and an RTX 2080 Super Max Q. Now the display itself can be configured. It's a 15.6 inch matte Full HD IPS panel, and it's not that great, but we'll talk about it later. The I.O. is excellent, with three USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, a microphone jack and a headset jack, a gigabit Ethernet port, as well as a Thunderbolt 3 port, an HDMI and a mini display port, and a 6-in-1 SD card reader. There's also the plug for your barrel charger, which is the only sore spot here. I don't like barrel chargers. They only work on one machine. If you travel, you have to bring the whole cable and power brick with you, because you can charge it off of USB-C. Barrel chargers are old, they need to disappear, please. You also get the mandatory webcam, which only goes up to 720p. It looks just barely okay, like most laptop webcams. And the laptop also comes with an Intel wireless chip that supports 802.11ax and Bluetooth 5. Now, unfortunately, this machine does not escape the flurry of stickers with no less than three present, plus a Sound Blaster X Pro Gaming printed logo. Why, oh why, would you ruin a perfectly good design with these horrible sticky messes that are horrible to remove without damaging the casing? Stop including stickers on your laptops, please. No one wants them. Now, in terms of build quality, it's definitely a nice build. It's not that thick for the power it provides, although it is still a big boy. It's fully made out of black aluminum, apart from the bezels around the screen and the hinge cover. It's also not the heaviest of laptops, at around 2 kilos or 4.4 pounds. Now, generally, this laptop feels super nice. It doesn't creak, it doesn't wobble much, it feels sturdier than my Huawei MateBook 13. It doesn't creak or flex much apart from the top of the laptop and the center of the keyboard. I'm not too worried about that flex, but I prefer it wasn't there, especially on the keyboard where I'm going to be banging on. Is that the right term? It sounds dirty. The port cutouts are alright, if not extremely well integrated with the ports themselves, and the keyboard and trackpad sit pretty well without much give or deformation in use. Now, the black aluminum doesn't seem to be prone to scratching, even after carrying it in a bag every single day, even around the ports where you try and connect stuff, it doesn't seem to be really scratching or peeling off, which is a good thing. Now the logo though, seems to be a sticker, and yeah, it seems to be willing to peel off every time you scrape something against it. After a few days in the bag, I already lost a small bit right there in the bottom, and yeah, that's, uh, that doesn't inspire confidence, so at that point might as well not include the logo if you're just going to stick it on. Now in terms of keyboard and trackpad, after a few weeks of use, I can say the keyboard is good, but not great. First, let's talk about the elephant in the room, the Windows key. Now this might seem like a small detail, but if you're going to ship a laptop aimed at Linux users with Linux pre-installed, you might as well go the extra length and replace the Windows key with something else, a Tux logo, your own logo, a super key, even a, a Mac-like weird shaped square logo. Just don't put a Windows logo on a machine that will be pre-installed with Linux. People are going to be sensitive about that, I'm sensitive about that, and I wish this key had been replaced. Now the typing experience is good, with good key travel, a good clicky sound that is not too loud but satisfying enough, and key stability is okay as well. I do feel that the keys lack a bit of bounce back, they sometimes feel a bit too mushy, but generally that's a pretty good experience, at least for me who's used to laptop keyboards. Now mechanical keyboard enthusiasts will probably not find anything to like here, but honestly they probably don't find anything they like on laptops anyways, and honestly for me I prefer my MateBook 13 keyboard, or even MacBook keyboards. Well. No, not that one, not, not that keyboard, the, the newer one or the older one. You still get a full-size keyboard though, with a complete number pad and a big set of function keys, which unfortunately lack media controls and require pressing the function key to actually do anything, which is always a bummer for me. 
Personally, I don't like having the F1, F2, F3 keys as the default. I like having the brightness control, the volume control, the media controls as the default. I think it's just more practical. Now the keyboard also is backlit with multicolored RGB that you can control from a small utility, Juno Computer's ship, or directly from the function keys on the number pad. I have zero use for this feature and I find RGB super tacky, but for people who like it, it's there. Now the trackpad itself is very good. It's one of the most precise I've used on a laptop running Linux, or on a laptop period. It's smooth and feels like a glass trackpad and is sized correctly, although the off-centered placement hurts my weird mind. I can safely say it's better than the MateBook 13 trackpad and it's probably on par with the MacBook trackpads as well. Now the big bummer about the trackpad for me is the two button layout. I really dislike this. I like having a one single clean trackpad like a diving board mechanism or a fully clicky trackpad. Having two buttons is just weird to me. It feels like going back to the olden days. It's not as easy for me to use. I need to aim for which button I want to click instead of just using two fingers to press on the trackpad. It just doesn't feel as nice. Now let's talk about the display, and at first, as I said in my first impressions video, I thought it looked great. The viewing angles are awesome, the resolution is the right one for a 15.0 inch screen, 1080p is largely enough, and it's a matte display, which is pretty awesome. But there are some issues. The 144Hz refresh rate felt like a gimmick at first, but once I got used to it, moving to a 60Hz display was a big step back. It just feels so much smoother in daily use, like the animations are more responsive, the clicks feel better, the trackpad even feels smoother thanks to that. It's just a great experience, and as a matter of fact, when I went back to my two display setup with two 60Hz panels, I immediately went nuts and I just bought a freaking ultra wide with 100Hz refresh rate because I just couldn't get used to it. I just couldn't get used to going back to 60Hz. Now the real problem of this screen is color accuracy. If you work in any kind of media production and you need to make sure that your colors are going to be accurate, this probably isn't the laptop for you. This is an issue. For gaming, you will not care, you will not mind, it will look great, saturated, you will enjoy gaming on this display. But for anything that you need color accuracy for, like video editing, photo editing, you're gonna need to tweak that. And I don't know anything about ICC color profiles, maybe you could use that to tweak the color calibration of the display. The two profiles that are shipped by default with Ubuntu on the laptop look exactly the same and don't do crap. So basically, yeah, if you want to use this display, you're going to have to color calibrate it yourself. Now let's talk about performance, because this, this is a beastly laptop, right? So let's see how it performs. Now on Geekbench, the Neptune 15 got 1,279 in single core and 6,992 in multi-core. This is higher than my Ryzen 5 2600 on my desktop, which reads 1022 and 5335 respectively. My MateBook 13, with its Core i7-8565U, got 1156 in single core and 3180 in multi-core. Now the 10th gen i7 in the Neptune 15 is super powerful, it single-handedly beats every other device I own, even my kinda strong desktop. It's super strong and it's probably due to the airflow, it has a big chassis, the processor is newer, it has faster cores, and yeah, it's just generally a beast of a processor. Okay, now let's see about gaming with the proprietary NVIDIA drivers installed and the laptop switched to NVIDIA mode. On Total War Warhammer 2, I got around 45 FPS at max settings, which is respectable. We're not reaching the 144 FPS limit here, far from here, but it's a good performance. To reach 60, I had to get settings down to high. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it ran at an average of 81 FPS at high settings without a hitch, but it couldn't reach 144 either. On highest settings, I hit an average of 72, which isn't bad. And this brings us to another issue with this machine, and this is the noise, the fan noise. When you're on Intel mode, basically they don't kick in at all unless you're using CPU intensively. If you're on Nvidia On Demand, so basically using the Intel graphics, it's okay as well, but as soon as you start taxing the NVIDIA GPU, the fans started kicking, and they are loud. They are seriously loud. Look, when I was gaming at home in my office with a good pair of headphones, I didn't care. I didn't really hear the fan noise. It was alright, but I couldn't see myself recording any gaming session on it, because the mic would have picked that up like crazy. But in my office, with my colleagues around in an open space, there was no way I would ever use the NVIDIA GPU. These guys would have stapled my head or another more sensitive part of my body to my desk. It's just too loud for using in an open environment. Now for the battery life, it's 
Okay, I've used it mainly in Intel mode with Nvidia on demand and for a workflow that I use at my day job, which is the laptop unplugged from its uh, power charger, plugged into a 1080p display with a Bluetooth mouse connected, Bluetooth keyboard connected, some headphones, brightness at maximum and using basically mostly web browsers and Wi-Fi enabled. The machine in this configuration lasted for about three hours and 50 minutes. I unplugged it at 9.30 and I kind of had to replug it at 12.20 when I went out to eat. So basically a half a day in this configuration. When I used it completely unplugged from any peripherals in pure laptop mode with 70% display brightness and the same workload, like about 20 tabs open of two different browsers and using them intensively, I got around 5.30 to 6 hours of battery life, which is all right, but not great. Honestly, Linux laptops do have a battery problem. Battery life on Linux is generally not as good as what you could get on a Mac or on a same laptop running Windows. It's just not good anymore, not good enough. And we need to work on that. But this machine is not specifically good or bad in terms of battery life. It just does its job correctly like any other Linux laptop would do. Now, if you turn the refresh rate down to 60 Hertz, you can probably eke out more battery life from this laptop, but I don't see this as a realistic scenario. If you've got that 144 Hertz panel, you're gonna wanna use it. Now, in terms of price, my retail unit goes for 1600 pounds, only with a 512 gigabyte SSD instead of a 256 that I got on this one. This is about $1,800 or 2,000 euros, and it's on par with other Linux laptop manufacturers. It's on the higher end of the spectrum, and it's an okay price for a machine that's mainly geared at gaming enthusiasts. Now to conclude, what is this machine good at? It's a good desktop replacement. The performance is great, the throttling doesn't really happen, no thermal throttling on this thing, or at least not often, and even though the fan noise is pretty strong, the fact that you can carry it around and it's relatively light at only 2 kilos is, makes it a good desktop replacement that you can lug around from time to time. Now for precision work, for color accurate work, it is not a good option. The panel is just not color accurate enough. And if you know about ICC color profiles, maybe you can tune it back to something usable, but I don't know anything about this. I don't really care about learning about this. So yeah, it's just not a display for me. Now for gaming, it's going to be good. It's gonna work. It's gonna be good enough, but I don't think you're gonna take advantage of that 144 Hertz panel in every game at ultra settings. There is no way this 2060 can push this kind of performance on max settings. So basically for competitive gaming like CSGO, League of Legends, stuff like that, they're older games, they don't use as much graphical power, you're gonna be able to game at 144 Hertz, no problems. For more intensive AAA titles, you're gonna have to stick with 60 FPS and the 144 Hertz panel is just going to be useless in those use cases. So would I buy this laptop? No, not for my use case, but not because it's a bad device. It is very well made. The aluminum is solid, it doesn't creak. It's super performant, but the noise is just too important for me. It's just too much noise. I work in an open space. I need to take advantage of that graphics processing unit on my lunch breaks to edit videos or from time to time to edit photos or do some graphics work. And if that Nvidia GPU makes the fan ramp up like crazy, my colleagues are gonna kill me. I cannot afford that level of noise. So no, I can't see myself using this as my daily driver anymore. But if you work in your own office or at home and you don't really care about the noise level because you have like active noise cancellation headphones or just a good pair of headphones, well then, you might not care, and the performance in this thing is pretty amazing, so you might want to go for it. So that's it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, don't hesitate to like or dislike if you didn't. You can also subscribe and turn on notifications if you want to receive more videos like this one in your subscribe feed. And if you really want to help support the channel, I've got some merch that you can buy. You can join my amazing Patreon subscribers, my YouTube members, get access to a monthly Patreon cast, the right to vote on my videos. I'll leave all the links to that in the description below. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!